Welcome to This Week in BJJ, the only show running the gamut of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and running it live every Friday night. Hello guys and welcome to a new episode of This Week in BJJ. My name is Budo Jake and I'm here to share with you all the latest events in the Jiu-Jitsu world. Tonight my special guest is Abida. This is the Mardi Gras Bach celebrating Mardi Gras, which was last Tuesday. We have a great show for you tonight. We have interviews with AJ Agazarm, Terry Reeves, and special guest in the studio tonight is Sean Roberts. He's also going to be teaching a technique for you on the mats. So let's get to it. Let's talk about the news. Usually Budo Dane's here to help out uh, with the news, but uh, he got hit by a meteor this morning, so he's not going to be here tonight. I expect him back on the next show. So first up is the Pan Kids. This is the second annual edition of this tournament exclusively for kids, and uh, there was a record turnout of over 600 kids, and the, uh, the win winning in team by points was Team Atos. As many of you know, the Mendez brothers have a school here in Costa Mesa, and they lead an excellent kids program, and the results are very clear that they were able to win. Team Lloyd Irvin was in second place, missed first place by only three points. The Mendez brothers had 149, Team Lloyd Irvin had 147. So that's a, a great performance by Team Lloyd Irvin, a relatively small school uh, for, for getting that close to first place. And in third place, we had Nova Uniao with 100 points. Great job, kids. And next up is Abu Dhabi Pro Trials in Miami. A lot of people get confused about the name. ADCC is no gi. Abu Dhabi Pro is with the gi. And we've shown you a few videos if you subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, over the past few weeks from the Abu Dhabi Pro Trials in San Diego. But what I'm talking about now is the Pro Trials in Miami. The Pro Trials combine the brown and black belts. And I'm just going to read through a list here of the gold medalists. Under 143 pounds, Brian Macheca from ATT took the gold. Under 163 pounds, Lucas Lepri from Alliance took the gold. Under 183, Ricardo Hesende from Avengers took the gold. And under 202 pounds, Homolo Bajal from Gracie Baja took first. Over 202 pounds, Tiago Dominguez from De La Hiva won. And in the open division, Marcel Gonsalves from the Avengers took home the gold. Great job, guys, and we look forward to seeing you all at the Abu Dhabi Pro Tournament, which takes place in Abu Dhabi. Now I have some uh, sad news to share with you. Keiko Fukuda was a Japanese-born American judoka, highest-ranked female in, hist in history. She had a ninth don from the Kodokan, tenth don from USA Judo. She was the last surviving student of judo founder Jigoro Kano, and she did a lot for women's judo and judo in general. That being said, let's take a look at some footage. Uh, this was from a documentary fr uh, called Be Strong, Be Gentle, Be Beautiful. Kodokan Jochibu no obi te yu, ranku te yu, yu no ande, hoken teki yan, hoken teki nan desu. Onna wa mo, go dan de, mo, she said she's going to show. All right. <laughs> so look, strong arm. <laughs> I feel the pain every bit of it. Go kekkon shite kate o motte. Sore ga futsu no kitari deshita yo ne. So, so. Sore wo oshinokete jibun no honto ni shinjita michi wa aruitte kita. ということはものすごく強い決意だと思ったんですよね私は。それがあの。
あた私はもう結婚結婚私の人生は決まった時ですよね結婚するかそれとも柔道で生きるかっていうこと,ことでそれで柔道に決めてそれがこんなに長いと思わなかった。優しくっていうのは、銃から生まれた言葉です。銃っていうのは柔らかいっていう書くんですよね。孤独感の本っていうのがあるんですよね。と。大の男がこう立ってるんですね。そうとあの、小さな女性が。和服を着て。この指で、胸をちょっとしてんですね。そうと後ろ崩れ、崩れてるんです。そう、で、そこそこ、それが。銃の、の、銃の根本です。Once again, the footage that you just watched is from an unfinished documentary titled Be Strong, Be Gentle, Be Beautiful. For more information, check out flyingcarp.net. If losing one of Judo's greats wasn't,、uh, wasn't bad enough, another bombshell dropped on the grappling world this week, and that was the news that the IOC is going to drop wrestling from the 2020 Olympics. And I think all of you grapplers that are watching are shocked by this news. Wrestling is a sport that's been in the Olympics since the first modern Olympics in 1896. And、uh, the decision was the result of a secret ballot process conducted in Switzerland. Wrestling is not, was not the only sport on the chopping block. Some other threatened sports include field hockey, taekwondo, and the pentathlon. Pentathlon? Do you know what the pentathlon is? It、uh, involves fencing, shooting pistols, jumping horses, swimming, and running cross country. You know, I. I I'm sure not only grapplers, but、uh, most rest- Olympic fans are surprised that you know, wrestling really resembles the Olympics. There's wide, a wide number of countries, actually, 71 countries were represented in the wrestling in the last Olympics. And it's something that、um, certainly existed long before the Olympics. It just seems ridiculous that,、uh, that they decided to cut it. But it's not a final decision. They're going to meet again in May to make the final decision. And、um, There is room for one more sport. So there's a small chance the wrestling could get back in. Other sports that、uh, are, could be considered to be added include karate, squash, roller sports, sport climbing, wakeboarding, wushu, and baseball. Come on, guys, put, put wrestling back in. What are the criteria to determine what、uh, sport should be X'd?、Uh, there are a number of, of、uh, criteria. Television ratings, ticket sales, anti doping policies, and global po- popularity and participation are some of those factors. So stay tuned, do anything you can, talk on Facebook, get the word out that we want wrestling back in. Okay, let's talk about some nice news. The Pan Jiu Jitsu Tournament is coming up on March 20th through the 24th. This is the largest Jiu Jitsu tournament in the world. There's an expect over 3,000 competitors are expected this year. And as usual, your friends here at Budo Videos are going to be broadcasting every day. That's five days of jujitsu. As usual, you are going to be able to choose which mat you want to watch. So if you have a friend that's competing, there's no doubt that you'll be able to watch him. You just have to know what mat he's going to be on and approximately what time. And there's going to be some new technology that we're going to be unveiling pretty soon. Budo Dave has been hard at work guiding the team. Getting this product even better than it has been in the past. The IBJJF has been working closely with us to develop this new technology, and、uh, stay tuned. We'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about in the weeks to come. But suffice to say, we're going to make your experience watching the pan a little bit better this year. On screen, I'm going to show you the、uh, schedule. So if you're、uh, wondering what days you might want to tune in, of course, you can tune in all, all the days. But、uh, the big days for, if you're not just looking for a family member or a friend, the big days are Saturday and Sunday. That's when all the black belt action takes place. I don't know what it is about today. A lot of bad news. But、uh, this is the last one, last bad news, I promise. 
Eddie Bravo was setting up a tournament called the, the called the SAO Submission Submission Only Worlds. Yeah, submission only worlds. And it's a Nogi tournament. 16 guys, uh, Crone Gracie, Bill Cooper, and a bunch of other guys were already involved. $20,000 first place prize is what he was talking about. And uh, it was going to be the weekend after the pan. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen. Hopefully, he's going to get things set back up and, uh, and do it a little bit later in the year. But this is what uh, Eddie Bravo had to say. Bad news. Without getting into details, the financial backing for the event fell apart. We will regroup and find new investors. I apologize to all involved, the competitors on it, my event coordinator, OTM, Budo Jake, and especially the fans who are looking forward to the event. Sal will be back. July is my new target date. Eddie Bravo is always doing interesting things, and I hope he can get this going. It sounded like a great tournament, uh, certainly a little different than we're used to with the sub submission-only rules. So uh, fingers crossed Eddie's going to make this happen a little later this year. Okay, it's time for an inter interview. Uh, let's take a look. I'll come back and explain. <music> Terry Reeves plays Haley on the NBC drama Chicago Fire. She's a blue belt at Gracie Baja Encino, and she's not too hard on the eyes. Let's take a look and see what Terry has to say. Okay, this morning we're chatting with Terry Reeves, who trains with J.P. Garcia at Gracie Baja Encino, and she also plays Dr. Haley Thomas on Chicago Fire on NBC. Good morning, Terry. Good morning. So, you know, it's always fascinating to me how people get into the art of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Can you tell us your story? Well, uh, mine was kind of a fluke. I, um, as an actress, often get cast as the girl next door sort of thing, and I dreamt of playing someone like Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Alias, you know, the girl who kicks butt. And so I was like, I got to put martial arts on my resume. What's the closest one to my house? There's this thing down the street. I went and I was like, I'll go for a couple weeks and I'll put it on my resume. I'll be done. And it happened to be Gracie Baja in Zeno. And, uh, and I fell in love with it right away. And then ha happened to stumble upon, I think, one of the most important martial arts that exists. And so I haven't left it two years since. <laughs> right, for sure. So you chose the, the art based on location. It could just have easily, easily have been a ninjutsu school, right? Absolutely, yeah. So I got, I got really lucky because after doing research, you realize, one, I, I'm not going to get punched in the face uh, while doing jujitsu. And two, it's, it's actually ideal for uh, women because Elio Gracie, you know, um, developed it for people, and you'll correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but for people that maybe are weaker or um, smaller in size. And so the strategy of this martial art helps people like me, who's a woman fighting against, you know, a 200-pound man. So it's ideal for me that way. Right. Now, you mentioned training for women. Women oftentimes have a hard time adapting to the art because the idea of rolling around with a bunch of sweaty guys isn't too appealing <laughs> for most women. Uh, how did you get over that? Know. What's wrong with that? <laughs> um, uh, you, you forget about it. In the heat of the moment, you're just trying not to get choked out. And so it becomes more about um, strategy and less about there's a man's armpit in my face. Uh, some men are more clean than others. Um, so please wash your geese. But yeah, uh, that was actually how my husband got into it is because I kept coming home in the sweaty uh, clothes, smelling like boy. And he's like, what the heck are you doing all day? So now he trains with me too. That's great. Yeah. You mentioned uh, a tip for, for all the guys out there to, to wash your geese after every class. That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other tips for guys who might be training with women that might just not think about what they should be doing? You know, the biggest piece of advice is it's a great time to practice your technique because, yeah, you can smoosh me into the mat with your 200 pounds or your big arm muscle, but you're not learning anything. Um, and the, the biggest compliment I get is that women are better at technique because we have to be because we can't we, we have less muscle than a, a bigger guy. So when rolling with a woman, I would say avoid using your strength. Um, and and see how much your tech, how far your technique can take you, and that's what I do when I roll with women that are smaller than me. I'm I'm not the lightest weight class, so I incorporate that too. Great tips, Terry. So you mentioned that you got your husband into the art. Have you got any of your friends into jiu-jitsu as well? Um, no, I, I haven't. <laughs> What's wrong with me? I've made a lot of amazing friends, though. Mm -hmm. the, the community is fantastic. It's like a family. And have you, uh, do you have any interest in competing? I have competed. Uh, I did a, a white belt IBJJF competition and, um, and realized that while my game might be great, my mental game needed improving. 
Um, so then I went back when I first got my blue belt and did another competition, but not IBJJF, sort of more low key, um, and had a lot of fun doing that. And realized that competing just it's not about winning; it's about um, an amazing place to train even more. But while I'm working on the show. Uh, I don't want to get any injuries because <laughs> then they might not put me on television if I have a black eye. So I, I tend to not compete while shooting. Right. Last question for you, Terry. Has your jiu-jitsu training helped your acting at all? Yes. Oh, my gosh, yes. Um, jiu-jitsu requires a lot of mental discipline uh, and belief in oneself if you're going to uh, complete a move or survive. Um, so that is actually something I've incorporated into my acting. I mean, you walk into an audition room, belief in yourself, e- even when you could freak out, is, um, is, is so important. Or walking into a set when you're with you know, famous actors and you're like some no-name, belief in oneself is a, is a big deal. Um, and that mental discipline about preparation and um, uh, studying you know, the art of jiu-jitsu or the, the art of script analysis, like all of that discipline um, sort of uh, mixes together and it's helped me that way. Also, I feel much more in my body. It teaches you body awareness, and I feel you know uh, much more in control of where my arms are at all times. Or, do you know what I mean? And my, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, before we let you go, is there anything else you'd like to let our audience know? Um, I, I hope that there are women watching this, and that more of them will come train, because there's no reason not to. It's really fun, and you feel strong, and women are beautiful. So we should come train together. <laughs> I agree. (laughs) Thank you very much for your time this morning, Terry. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. All right. Goodbye. Okay, guys, we're back, but we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with AJ Agazarm. Budovideos.com, home of the world's largest selection of quality jiu-jitsu kimonos. Show your role, Storm, Tatami, Bull Terrier, Venom, and others. Styles from more than 30 top brands in stock and ready to ship. Budovideos.com, you're only a click away from owning a new gi today. So Lloyd Irvin has BJJ Kumite, which was a tournament for brown belts only. It took place in December, and AJ Agazarm took part in the tournament. So did Sean Roberts, who's going to be on later. They were very quiet about what happened at the Kumite. They were uh, bound to secrecy for a while until some of the YouTube videos that Lloyd Irvin put out. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out Lloyd Irvin's YouTube channel and watch some of the Brown Belt Kumite. It's a great gift to the grappling community. Lots of excellent uh, grappling. And uh, I had a lot of questions for AJ. Uh, This was his first interview that he did about the tournament. So, that being said, let's take a listen. So I'm here with A.J. Agazarm. He's one of America's best brown belts. And A.J., I wanted to talk to you about your involvement in Lloyd Irvin's BGJ Kumite. How was your experience there? Well, my experience was definitely an experience, uh, to say the least. You know, I traveled. I was finishing up my time in California, and then my plan was to originally just go from California right to um, back to Florida to help my brother with his wrestling season and his team. And, um, you know, a situation arose where um, Lloyd Irvin was putting together a, a tournament for a lot of the tougher brown belts in the, in the world. And I thought it would be a good idea for me to, um, on my way back to Florida, just take, make a pit stop in Maryland and do a little tournament before and end up back in Florida after that. You know, when I was when I first heard about the tournament, I wasn't clear with the what the format was going to be. And even when I watch a show, sometimes I'm not clear with how far we are through the tournament and where it's going. Did you know all these details before you signed up? No, actually, great question because that 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 was the one reason why I chose to do it because there it, a lot of it was unknown. And and me, most people who know me, I'm I'm an adventurer. I'll take. You know, I, I fly by the seat of my pants. I just I go after something, and you know, a lot of the times I don't know the details. I'm just going with the flow. Now, I know there was a lot of things that happened before that this Kumite was put together. It was originally supposed to be a super fight. Um, then it turned into something else, and then it turned into something else. Um, so a lot of the details were uh, unknown. And a lot of my friends were telling me, hey, Lloyd's putting this thing together. I think you should do it. Um, you know, I... I wasn't connected with him on Facebook at the time. And, you know, then I contacted Keenan actually directly 
and said, hey, what's going on? I'm, you know, I'm trying to get back to Florida right after the California, uh, my time in California. If it can work out, I'd like to make it happen if you knew the details. And he said, honestly, I don't know the details. Contact Lloyd. So I contacted Lloyd and, I, and asked him kind of a little bit of a rough draft. That's all I needed to see if I could make it swing. Um, wind the clocks back. I had a, a seminar that was already put together for uh, kind of my appreciation seminar as my time in California. And um, a lot of people were questioning, hey, AJ, you know, I thought you were in the Kumite. So I didn't see you on the first day. Well, the reason why is I, that Sunday I had a, a seminar and I couldn't fly out to um, Maryland until the Tuesday. And anytime you fly from the West Coast to the East Coast, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a full day of flying. So I, I didn't know the details. And, and um, you know, looking back on it, I think if I would have known a little bit more of all that was entailed, I would have made a more rational decision. Um, but things that I were under the impression of originally weren't the way things were originally laid out. And, um, you know, that happens in life. You know, a lot of times you get thrown, a, you know, a lot of curveballs, and it's just really dependent upon how we react to it. You can't really control um, all the variables. So, Right. Well, props to you for going out there and taking on a challenge like that. You, d you did a great job. But, AJ, uh, editing is, uh, you know, the look of a show can be changed a lot by the editing. Do you think that the way that Lloyd Irvin's BJJ Kumite was edited uh, puts the competitors in a fair light? The show was made to benefit Lloyd Irvin. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, I, I think the way I, I haven't really watched much of it. I haven't really been paying attention to a lot of the the um, the footage. But from what I did see, you know, there there are a few things in my eyes. I could say, you know, I I, I think it's being leveraged a little bit more to to push you know some things in his favor or the t favor of Team Lloyd Irvin. Um, or for Keenan, you know, that's inevitable. You know, he ran the tournament. It was his gig. He had us forced to sign this contract that was, you know, full with all these, you know, making us liable for all these things. And, um, you know, I, I'm not really, I'm not really pleased with the way that things were, but we kind of walked into that going into it. Um, my thoughts when I did it was just, you know, this is just another challenge for me. You know, I'm not challenging Keenan or I'm not challenging any other other uh, brown belts in the world. I'm I'm challenging myself, you know. So I, I think the way that he did portray some of the situations could have been a little bit different, maybe in the favor of the fighters, as we did put a lot on the line. But like I said, a, a lot of it was just done to put him in, in – uh, in good good sight and a lot of people don't realize that you know some of the fights I, I i i distinctly remember a fight that i had with ilke the guy who was the the lightweight european champion went 47 minutes i fought a lot of lightweight guys and ilke is probably one of the tougher lightweights that i've ever fought and it was a 48 minute fight and for him to not portray but four seconds of our fight i mean Either that's a stab at me, or he's trying to heighten some of the other athletes, and um, I, I think that's a lot of you know that that's unfair in itself. Also, maybe showing some positions where we're being threatened versus some of the positions that we're not being dominated in. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, if Lloyd has beef with me. Um, you know, I, I'm not really sure into his perception of me or things like that, but. Um, from some of the messages that I received from some of my fans and friends where they weren't really pleased with the way that he was originally uh, was the way that he was, was making me look like in the videos. Uh, there was a situation that arose with, did I tap or did I not tap? You know, at the end of the day, at the end of this tournament, I look back on it. I'm still me. I didn't change because of this tournament. You know, I didn't get any better. I get any worse because of this tournament. It was just another tournament under my belt. I, I had 14 in the year. Um, so, uh, you know, looking back on, on him trying to make, you know, take advantage of an opportunity to use some video footage to make some people, you know, talk more about a show or make some controversy about an episode, you know, that, that's him. That's what he does. That's what he's known for. And uh, there's a saying that we have um, that I've come accustomed to and um, Brazilians kind of use it a lot. It's called set you. It's a it's a Brazilian phrase that they used to kind of say the guy that's always trying to leverage a situation. Um, you know, I, I think 
Lloyd did a, a very good job of leveraging what he was thrown together and, um, and, and, and benefited himself pretty well because of it. So props to him for that. Um, as far as that situation goes, you know, sir, for my fans out there, my friends out there, um, you guys know me. If, if a guy gets me in a submission, I'll tap. It's very hard to, to get me there. Um, but if, if it happens, you know, you know, dang well that I will, I will say you got me. So, yeah, you're one of the most resilient guys I've ever trained with. <laughs> That's for sure. And that comes across uh, on your matches too. How many matches did you have in total there? Was it, how many matches did you have at the committee? I think it was between 16 and 14. I can't really remember too well. Um, but there were some matches, you know. I, I had matches that were over an hour, you know, over 45 minutes. One match was, you know, less than 10, I mean, less than 15 seconds. But I, I got my, you know, fair share of competition, and that's what I really wanted. Um, I've been quiet about this tournament since it happened. And a lot of people have been asking me about it, and I just kind of kept quiet. Um, and, and you're the first person that I've kind of opened up a little bit about it. Um, but I think it's... Uh, I, I, you know, in retrospect, I think it was a, it was an awesome experience. Um, yeah, for, you were able to compete against uh, so many of the, you know, some of the toughest brown belts in the world. Now, when you look back on those fifteen or so matches that you had, how do you feel about yourself and your jujitsu? Any, any interesting new thoughts? You know, I, I think a lot of it for me was, uh, you know, reaffirming who I am as an athlete. Um, you know, you know, actually. I had a conversation, um, many people don't know this, I actually roomed with um, Gary Tonin. We stayed at, um, a, f a friend of Gary's, we stayed at his apartment and, and we were outside of the house um, that everyone else was staying. It was just me and Gary and um, we were staying in Seth's apartment. He was um, part of a, a jiu-jitsu school nearby. And um, I got to talking with Gary and, and Gary's perception of me at the tournaments was, you know, this is, you know, very tough guy, straight face. When he goes to the tournaments, he's very serious. Um, but I think anybody who knows me outside the mats knows that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy go lucky. I'm, I'm one person on the mats and one person off the mats. And, um, and it was kind of, you know, a, a shocker for me to hear Gary say that because, you know, when he, he was living with me, he, he said he didn't know really what to expect, but he knew that, um, it would be fun either way. And at the end he was just kind of like, you know, I was, I was kind of wrong about you. Um, you know, I, I came across maybe as a tough guy, but I think most people who get to know me a little bit more, you know, they realize I'm just, I'm fun and exciting and, um, I'm one person on the mats and one person off. So, um, to answer your question regarding, um, did I learn some things about myself or, you know, did, I'm no different. I'm, the, I'm still me. It's the same person it was. I, I think a lot of people are putting, um, exalting this tournament as opposed to some of the other tournaments out there. This was Lloyd's way of gauging where Keenan was at. Mind you, he was trying to originally to set Keenan up with one of the tougher brown belts in the, in the world. And he wanted to gauge to see where Keenan's at. Um, I don't think that this competition was any better than any of the IBJJF tournaments that have been held, the Europeans, the Pan Ams, the Worlds, um, the, you know, the top Europe, uh, IBJJF tournaments, I, I don't hold this above any of those. Um, in fact, this was Lloyd's way of saying, who's the best brown belt in the world? Well, there were a lot of variables that we did not know that we know going into IBJJF tournaments that we can control. Um, so does this mean at the result of this show, we have a clear cut decision on who's the best brown belt in the world? Absolutely not. Um, you know, the winner of this tournament was the best brown belt on that day, on this tournament. Um, and, you know, given the fact that there's a lot of other variables that um, I think if we would have known beforehand, there would have been a lot more different outcomes. All right. Sounds good. AJ, thanks for all your information today. Before we let you go, any, any last uh, thoughts? Yeah. I, uh, I'm, in, I'm at my brother's high school right now. I'm um, getting ready to take him over to his regional tournament. He just finished up the district last week. Our team one took first place in the district. Um, my brother took first in his district. Now we're headed into the regionals. Um, we're looking for a team title in the region, and we're also looking. We have 12 guys who qualified. We're looking to bring all 12 to the to the next stage. Um, 
to go to the state tournament, you have to place top four in your region. So um, I'm excited. So this is what I came back down from California for, to put my brother through his wrestling season. And it's been going really well. So um, I, I've this weekend and next weekend, and, you know, then I'm, I'm headed back to California to get some more training in with, with Kyron and, and Team Gracie Baja over on the West Coast and get amped up for the Pan Ams. Just finished the, the Europeans, and God, those freaking Meow Brothers are tough, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, you're one of the hardest-working guys out there, and you're always helping people. Appreciate that. Keep up the good work, and we look forward to seeing you at the Pan. Thank you, Jake. See you soon. See you, Jake. A relatively new part of the show is where we talk about promotions. Any black belts that have been promoted recently, we talk about them here on the show. If you'd like to talk about the fact that you've been promoted or a friend, you can email us at twibjj at budovideos.com. Just tell us your, your name, when you got promoted, and who promoted you. And if you can include a picture, we'll talk about it on the show. So we got a few guys to talk about. The first one actually is not a black belt. We made an exception this time and uh, because he's an outstanding brown belt. His name is AJ Souza. He competed at the Lloyd Irvin BJJ Kumite, uh, and he got promoted to brown belt just a few days before, and he went on to do very well at the tournament. He was promoted in December by Pablo Popovich. Next up is Pablo Blanchard. He was promoted to black belt in December by John Machado. He started his training in 1993, took a 10-year break, and restarted in 2008. Next up, we have three guys that got promoted by Pedro Bessa, who's a Eduardo Tellis, uh, Pedro Tellis black belt. Uh, Kevin Cox, Greg Creel, and Mark Tucker all got promoted in December. And finally, we have Isaac Chavez. He was promoted to black belt this month by Joseph Manuel, who's a Hobson Mora black belt. Congratulations, guys, and keep on rolling. Okay, we've got some, a couple new products to talk about, so let's go. First up is the Odyssey Rash Guard. This is a new rash guard by Nogi Industries. It's a series called the Artist Series. This is something that I'm spearheading. I'm finding local artists, well, not local, but artists around the world to participate in developing Interesting looking rash guards. This one is done by John Smalls, who's an artist out of New York, and uh, it's the sales are doing really well on Budo Videos and Nogi.com. It's priced at $49.95, and it's a limited edition, so if you want one, get it while you can. Next up is, uh, you know, we've been making boot, uh, DVDs at Budo Videos for a long time, and uh, not too long ago, we started making on-demand content. On-demand means you can watch it whenever you want, on your computer, at home, or wherever you are. So Chris Brennan uh, just came out with his Nogi Sweeps video on-demand. This is something that's been available on DVD before, but now it's on on-demand, and let's take a look at it. Nogi Sweeps by Chris Brennan. I'm going to set up like I'm going for a head and arm. I'm going to use my legs to push him away a little bit, bump his arm over to the other side. So I can scoot up on top of him just like this. I'm gonna tuck my foot in close, keep my knee by the head. I'm gonna put this foot in, sweep him to the back, okay? okay. Chris Brennan, his DVDs, uh, or videos in this case, he only concentrates on the highest percentage stuff. He doesn't do anything too flashy, just the, the, the core sweeps you need to know. And he has another video out called Guard Passes, and again, it's all the core guard passes for no gi that you need to know. This is also available on Buddha Videos right now for $14.95, and let's take a look. I'm gonna do the hop uh, to get the legs open. Now, once this happens, both my arms are gonna swim in at the same time. I don't wanna keep it down here. I'm gonna walk my foot up nice and high here. My forearm comes in front of the neck so he can't follow me. I'm gonna slide down this time. As he locks my leg out, go with it. Straighten my leg out. So again, you can get those videos on demand right now from Budo Videos for $14.95 each. All right, guys, we're going to be right back with one of the best brown belts in the world, Sean Roberts, so don't go anywhere. Hi, 
I, I pass him more, but I like to play guard too, you know, like I don't have like some, some strategy, you know. I go like if the guy, you know, pull guard, I like, you know, I can pass if, you know, if the guy try to, you know, exchange some takedowns and run, exchange some takedowns. If, I, if I'm not able sometimes to put the guy down and then I pull guard, so I don't have like one favorite, you know, technique or, you know, subject, you know, mm -hmm. I just, just fight, you know. Okay, guys, we're back. I'm here with one of the best brown belts in the world, Sean Roberts. Sean, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Good. So let's start from the beginning. Tell me how you got started in jiu-jitsu. Well, um, I got started in jiu-jitsu back in 2005. Um, so, um, I used to do karate before, and I did um, also I did basketball a lot. And there was an event like um, when I tried to sign up for the high school team in basketball, I didn't make the first cut, and I thought I was pretty good. You know, I went to I even played like at a halftime show at the Clippers game once. So I was like, okay, I'm good. I'm going to make it. I got cut the first round, so I was like, I, I kind of gave up basketball then. Then I was in, like, a couple of years. I didn't do anything. I was, like, in my room playing video games the whole time. And then, you know, I did wrestling for a short short moment for not even a year. And then I saw um, jiu-jitsu, you know. Um, actually, my dad brought it up to me, like, oh, there's this guy in UFC or something. I didn't show you before because I knew you were going to do this to the kids on the playground, but he does this thing where he takes the guys down and chokes them out. And I was like, okay. So I looked it up, and then I saw, like, you know, Horian Gracie, um, basic stuff. It was, like, Americana and armbar from the mountain, and, and it was just amazing, you know. So I'd go, I'd watch that, like, all day, get my dad, be like, hey, let me show you this. And I would do it, and he'd be like, does it, I'm like, does it hurt? He's like, yeah. I'm like, what about this? He's like, yeah, stop. Like, eventually he was like, okay, man, like, I have a job to do, and I can't go go to work all hurt. So he, we looked up um, a gym, and it was actually Half Gracie or Belinda. The gym moved a lot, so it evolved into a bigger gym. But it was a really small gym. I would say, like, 16 people would be, like, the max. And uh, I met Brad Jackson there, who was um, my instructor at the time. Still regard him as, like, one of the best instructors in the world. But um, that's how I got started. And then the first day, you know, I, I was kind of cocky. I came in, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to – I'm probably going to hang with all the white belts, probably tap some of the blue belts maybe. And then, no, just uh, – I got smashed. Right. All the girls smashed me. You know, so I was like, oh, I guess this is how it is. And then I started training, and I loved it, you know. So that's how I kind of got started. Has your training been consistent all yeah. these uh, eight years? Yeah. I mean, I've had a, had a knee injury. Um, I was out for like three months. Three months is the most mm -hmm. I've been out. I've been out like three months, like twice now for the knee. Mm -hmm. And for the – correct me if I'm wrong, but you've been connected with the Health Gracie team your whole career. Is that oh, right? yeah. This start to end. And then you've trained a lot with Health too, right? Yeah. I actually used to stay at his house a lot, um, spend the night there, spend like a month there. There's not a lot of information out there about Half, and I think a lot of people have, I wouldn't say negative opinion of him, but maybe a scary image yeah, of, of his persona. See that. Tell us a little bit about what what Half Gracie's like. Um, well, before I, I was never there. Before you know, I, I would come up north when I was a white belt once in a while and train, and everyone was like, you know, especially up north, it's really just like everyone's trying to kill each other. Of course, it's still like we're all teammates, we're all friends, and Half's just like really intimidating, you know. Um, like if he tells you to do something and you don't want to do it, even if it's something not in jiu-jitsu, like, hey, take this guy to the bank and do this, you're like, you don't want to say it, but you're like, yeah, okay, because you're like, he's he's kind of scary, like, at first, but um, especially in, in the past, like, three, even more, four years, he's really calmed down and, like, just relaxed. I think before he was 
crazy. Mm -hmm. a little, not crazy, but, you know, really serious, hit the students sometimes, you know, and that's why all the, you know, all the tough, a lot of tough guys come out, come out of there, you know, but he's really calmed down. Right. Certainly his school has a reputation yeah. for building really tough guys. Yeah. Who are some of the, the, the guys that you used to train with up there? Um, well, I didn't train up there. I, I just started training up there like four years, but some of the guys that are super good, um, Luke Stewart, uh, he had a match with Andre Gabao in MMA. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw it. it was, he swept Andre all over the place. Yeah, all over the place. Um, he has some guys that don't compete that much that are super good. He had, well, he had Cameron Earl, but, you know, he got into some trouble. He beat Marcelo Garcia like twice. Mm -hmm. um, Antonio Braganetto was up there for a while training. We got some really good guys there. What do you think it is about his school that makes guys so good at jiu-jitsu? Is it just his tough demeanor or is it something about his technical instruction? Um, the school is very, very tough, you know. Um, it's not that they're mean or in any way. It's just how everyone is. Like, the first time I went up there, like, you could sense just how tough it's going to be. Like, even before, like, if you're a new person, they would do warm-ups, like, super hard warm-ups. And they would try to make the, the visitor kind of leave the gym. Um, this is before things started to change. And try to leave the gym or kind of beat them up and try to send a message. Like, that's how all that got started. But... Now, just everyone trains hard still, or just no breaks. Mm -hmm. They get like six six minute rounds, well, like 15 seconds to find a new partner. Mm -hmm. Like, so there's like no water. You can't have water. You can't go to the bathroom. You got um, put quarters in your meter, then you're there until class is over. No water, nothing. If you're tired and you don't feel like rolling? Too bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you still training there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I train in Berkeley and San Francisco. So, Who teaches in Berkeley? Uh, Eduardo Fraga. He was actually one of my first instructors back in uh, when I started when I was a white belt. He got me to blue belt, had some visa problems, went back, came back, and then I came to train in Berkeley with him again. So mm. that's pretty cool. Nice. So you were involved in, in Lloyd Irvin's BJJ Kumite. Yeah. Let's start at the beginning. That First of all, um, again, you can see these videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Search for uh, Team Lloyd Irvin BJJ Kumite. This is a great tournament, including the world's best brown belts. And yeah. um, let's start at the beginning. When you first heard about this, what did you think? Um, I didn't even know what to think. I thought it was awesome. You know, um, I, I, at first I was like, I don't know if I'm good enough to do this. Or, cause I always think like, I think like that a lot, but um, I was like, oh, I'm just going to put what, like my credentials. And then I got a message back like, oh yeah, you, you're accepted. So I was like, oh crap. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Um, there's a few weeks where I was debating, like, I don't know if I'm going to go or not. And then I was just like, no, I'm going. So I just flew there and just, I didn't know what to expect. We talked to AJ a little earlier on the show and, and he said that he didn't know what the format of the event was. Uh, he learned a lot when he got there, but he wasn't, uh, he wasn't conditioned to deal with 14, 15 matches that, yeah. uh, that you're going to have. How about you? Oh, um, well, I'm always, I'm pretty much always in shape. You know, I'm there for the challenge. I didn't know what was going on, but, you know, it is a unique event. So I'm, I was kind of assuming that there's going to be a unique things going on. So just went in there, just whatever happens, happens. And um, I actually had, like, 22 fights. 22. So, yeah. Wow. Um, I actually injured two people, so the other people didn't get to fight them. So. Yeah, 22 matches over how many days? Was it? So I had... Three, three the first day, three the second day, three the third day, and two the last day. Wow, that's amazing. And then the finals are um, with the two best guys. Mm -hmm. You know, the wow. next, you get a day of rest, and then the best guys fight. Mm -hmm. And how many knees did you mess up over there? Um, I don't know. Hey, I, know <laughs> I know at least one, right. but unfortunately... That guy. For those of you who don't know, um, Sean Roberts' special move is the knee slicer or calf slicer. How long have you been doing that move? Um, I did it first time in 2007. So um, it was actually me, uh, Brad Jackson, and I kind of came up with the move. You know, so we was like, oh, I'm going to try this. I did it in a tournament. I was a blue belt, and I fought this brown belt. That was really good. What tournament was this? Um, it was actually Joe Morero's in-house tournament, but the brown belt was pretty good. So I just jumped in there, threw a calf slicer on him, and it worked. And I did it a couple times. I, I did it on Scott Epstein, I think, and did it on a couple other guys. But I never really used it a lot until the Kumite. Hmm. So. 
Calf slicers are a move that some people discredit saying, ah, it's just a pain move. But I, I can say that they hurt. Yeah. But looking at you do it on the, on the Kumite, it almost looks like nothing's going on. And guys are screaming, and oftentimes the doctor's running after checking their, their knee. Yeah, it, I heard, man, AJ Agazarm's knee. I couldn't believe it. But I, I didn't hear that knee pop, but I did it a couple times with other people, and it was their knee was popping, mm -hmm. and then they tapped, like, kind of too late. Do you think people just aren't familiar enough with the move to know how much danger they're in? Um, I think a lot of pride, you know, you don't want to get caught with a calf slicer. It's like getting caught in a footlock. Like, I don't want to tap to a footlock, you know, it's kind of like that. Right. If you get caught with something weird, kind of don't respect it. Right. How long have you had a, a, your brown belt? Um, I got in September 2010. Mm -hmm. so. Do you feel like this tournament, the, the Lloyd Evans tournament, has put more of a spotlight on the brown belts? Uh, definitely. Definitely. Brought, brought some really good guys, you know. I love the format, no time limit. It's awesome. You prefer that? Oh, yeah, because, like, you know, you go to IBJJF. I, I mean, I, I know AJ didn't agree with this, but I put this above the worlds because, you know, you go to the, it's eight minutes, you get swept, people stall. You know, there's there's kind of sneaky ways to stall. Keep working, but don't give them too much. And you go home, like, oh, I lost by a sweep, but, like, what happens if it goes beyond that eight minutes? Then you really get to see, like, who is really better at jiu-jitsu. You know, jiu-jitsu was never meant for a time limit, ever. So um, I think it just showed who, in the long run, who's up for it. Yes. Are you saying Keenan's better than you at jiu-jitsu? Um, well, we got to see, maybe I find him again or something, but he's awesome. Hmm. He's crazy good. How would you describe his jiu-jitsu? Um, well... When I fought him, what surprised me the most, I could not get my grips on him. Hmm. So um, he's really fast, doesn't let you, doesn't give you any time to get your grips. So he's always he's always on the offense, which I also like to be on the offense as well the whole time. So he's an excellent guard passer. Um, we had a long match; we had like thirty minutes. So I was on top of him for a long, a long period of time. Really hard guard to pass. When I was on top of him, I couldn't really do much. Mm. I was like, I felt like I was stalling because, you know, I couldn't do much. I mean, I felt like if I moved, I'd get stuck here or stuck here. And then once he swept me, he just knows a lot about jiu-jitsu and pass really easy. So mm. he's amazing. You know, I can't, can't say anything else. A lot of brown belts can't wait to get their black belts because yeah. you, certainly you'll have – you and all the brown belts out there will have a lot more notoriety. You'll get a lot more coverage uh, when you're a black belt. But how do you feel? Are you in a, a hurry to get your black belt? I would like it. You know, um, I, I feel like I've done I've done almost everything I could at brown belt. You know, um, I haven't won the Pan Ams or Worlds, but that's okay. Um, I'll probably be doing it as a brown belt again. But I would like, you know, I'm always, I always like to challenge myself. I like to, I would like to know what it feels like to go against Marcelo Garcia, you know, what I can do, how long with him especially, but how long I could last against him. But I would like, I think I could do some damage in the black belt, you know. Mm -hmm. So I've been a brown belt for longer than I've been at any other belt, which is like two years. Mm. So, How do promotions work at Health Gracie Jiu-Jitsu? Is it based on competition or, or what? Um, kind of just based on you and what your, um, how, how good, how, how things you could get. Mm. You know, I've seen... There have been blue belts that are just like, what the heck? This guy's closer to brown belt than he is to blue belt, and he's still a blue belt. It's, it's ridiculous sometimes. Some mm. some people get held a long time there, a long time. If you could go back and talk to the Sean Roberts at white belt, what advice would you give yourself? <clears throat> Move up north. <laughs> <laughs> Move up north. I mean, I, I honestly had an awesome time. I met a lot of nice people, I, and I, I do miss all my friends in Southern California, but... You know, I only get to live once, and I would like to get good at jujitsu, good at jujitsu as possible. So, I'd probably moved up north because when I started, it was just a bunch of white belts and blue belts. You know, uh, a brown belt would be like legendary. You'd be like, whoa, there's a brown belt here. That's crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. So, if I moved up north, I think it'd be a better option. That's not a comment that I hear a lot. Southern California is referred to by a lot of people as the mecca of jujitsu. Yeah. There's a lot of the world's best instructors down here. You don't feel like you'd rather train with a Cobrino or Mendes or someone like that? Uh, no, I'm a very loyal person, you know, so um, something drastic would have to happen for me to leave the team. Mm -hmm. So. And you're down here this weekend for a seminar. Tell us about yes. that. Yes. 
Um, I have a seminar tomorrow. It's in uh, Santa Ana. So it's going to be happening tomorrow at 12. Um, if you go on my Facebook. It's uh, Facebook slash Triangle Master. Yeah, you can check it out there. Okay. What's your seminar going to be like? Well, it's going to be three hours. So I'm going to teach some moves that I normally don't show anyone besides my my friends and my teammates. I like to keep some moves to myself. I'm going to show those for sure. Um, some of the moves I did in the Kumite that actually didn't get, um, I don't think it, the editor noticed mm. the move. So that's pretty cool. So it's still secret a little bit. I'm going to show one really cool half guard sweep and some some unique submissions. Cool. And, and it's a really expensive seminar, right? No. <laughs> it's like $45, $40. That's a great deal. Once again, check out his Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash triangle master. All right. Um, so you're going to show a technique for us on the mats, right? Oh, yeah. What are you going to show tonight? Um, actually, there's an Americana that I like to do. Um, I always thought Americana was a strength move, you know, and I always thought, like, oh, the big guys get it. But um, me and Brad Jackson, I always used to do power lessons with him in the garage, and he showed me one Americana that works, usually works only on the skilled opponents, and I want to share it with you guys today. Sounds and great. If I could do another one, I have a half guard pass that I really like to do. Sounds excellent. Before we go to the mats, is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, I'd like to thank my sponsors on the mat, you know, um, my family. I love you guys. Without them, I would not be here. Um, also, I'm probably going to be moving back down to Southern California this year to take over a family business, um, Half Gracie Chino Hills. So I'll be teaching there soon. Excellent. That's good news. Actually, before we go, uh, every week we talk about uh, an email that comes in from one of our viewers. This comes in from Neil from Australia. Neil says, I recently competed in my first competition, the Nogi Australian Championship. Obviously at white belt, under 135 pounds, so he's a small guy. I ended up with second in my division. I got submitted in the final. For, my first question is, how seriously should I be taking competition at white belt? I was pretty gutted at losing as I thought I was still it was still a very winnable match and went completely against my game plan and I'm still thinking a lot about it. All right. So it's kinda of like my first tournament. My, um I think you should take anything in jujitsu if you love it, take it seriously, even if you're a white belt. Um, I have to admit, uh, my first tournament I lost. Um, I fought the adults and I cried. You know, it's really you know, it's really emotional, so I'll just take it serious right now, mm -hmm. might as well. But as a brown belt, now I look back and it's like not as big deal, not as big of a deal as now. Um, but at the time, it was a big deal. So. Yeah, and it, correct me if I'm wrong. I've competed a few times, and the mental aspect takes a lot, a lot of tr practice to get over. And in the, oh, the, the tournament of white belt, you're going to be so stressed out. I'll get over it. I never, yeah. I never got over being nervous. I still walk in. If it's a big tournament, my knees will shake. I'll get really irritable. I don't like to talk to people that much. Um, I get stomach pains. I'm still like that today. Are you any different than you were as a white belt in that respect? Better at jiu-jitsu. But, <laughs> but the mental aspect is the same, right? Uh, yeah, basically. Wow. wow. I've had a little different experience. I've become a little more comfortable yeah. with the competition experience. It's smaller tournaments. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's like you do it all the time, smaller tournaments. But when it comes to Pan Am's and Worlds, you're like right. nervous. Yeah, everybody's watching. Oh, yeah. So you heard uh, Sean's uh, advice there. Neil, my advice, you're just a white belt. You're just starting out at competing. I wouldn't take it as, as serious. I'm not as serious of a competitor as Sean. But uh, it's going to take you a while to get over the butterflies and just get out there and get the experience. After a few competitions, you're going to start feeling a little bit better about yourself and hopefully be able to implement your game plan a little better. And uh, Neil has one more question. At 135 pounds, I didn't see the point of entering the open division. Would you recommend it? Uh, I always did the open division, just some more experience. How much do you weigh? Um, around 180, somewhere in there. But so when, I was white ball, when I was white ball, I was like 141. So okay, very close. Still did the open, like right. to test myself. Yep. So a lot of the serious competitors, Kyotera included, uh, would probably tell you to do the open division. Um, a guy with a, <laughs> a day job like me, I would say that you're risking serious injury being yeah. one of the smallest be careful. guys. Yeah. Be careful. I've, I've went against like, people like 300 pounds, and I'm like, should I, should I just not fight them? But eventually I'm just like, no, I'm just going to go in there. But okay. sometimes I, I got squished in the submission once, and I should have just been like, nah, you could, I give up. You could go ahead of me. But... 
I was a white belt at the time. Right. <laughs> Sean, thanks for sharing for that. And we're going to be right back on the mats to learn some cool moves from Sean Roberts.